Good morning, New City. Oh, let's try that again. Good morning, New City. So if you're joining us online for the first time, you can click the Start Here link and connect and fill out a virtual connect card to let us know that you're with us and how we can be praying for you. So let's all stand and hear our call to worship. And it reads, praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels, praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon, praise him, all you shining stars. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created, and he established them forever and ever. He gave decree and it shall not pass away. Our God shows his glory and excellence by making the stars above and the amazing earth that we get to stand and gaze upon. The waves in the ocean and the wind and the trees sing of God's greatness without a word. So let's sing and join creation this morning in praising our Lord Almighty. believed and ate the fruit God commanded them not to eat. Brokenness and sin entered the world, and since then we struggle with sickness, loneliness, and fear. 
And in those times, instead of running to Jesus for help, I often run to something to escape from the hurt, like binging the latest TV series. And you see, instead of running to the one who can restore us to himself, we often run away. But God is so gracious to pursue us even when we run from him. And the psalmist writes this, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. And let's confess this next part together. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. And so God cares deeply for us. He, he wasn't willing to leave us alone, but lovingly and mercifully sent Jesus. In light of his great compassion, let's confess our brokenness together. And then you continue to pray as the Lord leads and convicts. And so let's pray. Father, when I am overwhelmed by uncertainty and hurt in this world, I often run away from you, whether it's out of anger or pride. I know you alone satisfy in my mind, but often my actions and emotions speak otherwise. God, I want to run to you when life is hard. Help me to find joy in you alone, not in the things that last a little while. Lord, forgive us of turning from you to find our hope in other places. Thank you for being kind and merciful to us. Help us to rest in the mercy that you have shown us at the cross.
God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that forever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son here into this world to condemn, but in order that the world might be saved through him. In love, Christ took on flesh, and he stepped onto this earth. He took upon himself all of this pain and this horrible punishment that was assigned to us, and he victoriously rose to life so that we would not have to keep running away. Instead, we can just constantly run to him. Only through Christ do we find forgiveness and do we find hope, and only in our Savior do we find this pure and perfect joy and this peace. So let's sing of him.
for your mercy and kindness know no end. Even in our rebellion and brokenness, Christ pursued us in order to save those who would turn and trust in you. Thank you for being good to us far more than we deserve. Help us to look to you, to look to Jesus. Remind us that though this world and the things in it are not perfect, you are, and we can rest in that. Holy Spirit, continue to encourage us to the Savior this morning. Continue to speak the truth into us. Continue to speak the gospel into our lives. Father, we love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. Good morning. Welcome to New City. It's good to see you guys this morning. If you are visiting with us, uh, we're especially glad to have you, and uh, we would love to have you stop by and meet one of our Connect Team folks. If you have never done that, and fill out one of our info cards, um, I promise we won't drive you crazy or anything like that because you filled out a card, but we will send you home with the world's greatest coffee mug, um, just as a thank you for being with us this morning. Stop by if there are any questions, anything that they can help you with, they will be glad to. And uh, we'll follow up by email just so that you have a contact. If there's anything that we can, we can do for you, we will sure be glad to. Hopefully you guys got one of these when you came in this morning. And uh, really just a couple of things that um, I, I want to mention. One is uh, we are um, continuing to, uh, to, to try to keep things safe and, and be socially distanced and all that. And uh, this morning, we're, we're not all that full in this service. Our first service was full, so we never know which one's going to be full and which one is not. Um, but we need you to register uh, to let us know that you're coming uh, just so that we can know where our numbers are and make sure that everything is safe uh, and uh, assuming hopefully and prayerfully um, that Georgia doesn't spike again like a lot of the other states are and Macon doesn't spike again we can continue to gather and um, hopefully more and more people uh, will be able to come back but uh, we need you to register, let us know that you're coming, just so that we can keep um, a, a, a close watch on our number and know when we're getting um, too full, and we would hate for you to show up and it be a full Sunday and you not be able to come in because we're too full. So register, let us know that you're coming. Uh, the other thing, uh, read this, but the other thing that I wanted to remind you of is um, our partners meeting today. In our almost 13 years together, this is the first time we've had a, a special partners meeting, uh, and we are doing that this afternoon here. Uh, it will be at 3 o'clock partners, so meet here at 3 o'clock. If you can come early, there's a group that's going to meet at 2 o'clock uh, for prayer before our, our meeting, and um, if you can make that, it would be great, uh, but otherwise, plan on being here partners uh, at 3 o'clock so that we can discuss a few things, and um, yeah, so hopefully we'll see all of our partners uh, here. All right, we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 this week, and we're looking at verses 7 through 18. Um, Paul is continuing to defend himself uh, against false teachers and defend himself against, um, it, it's really more than defending himself, against the false apostles. Really what Paul is defending as he defends himself, uh, really what Paul is defending is, is the gospel. Uh, it's more than Paul that is at stake here, as people have said that uh, the Corinthians shouldn't follow him. It's Paul's, it's Paul's message that is at stake. As he defends himself uh, this week, what we see uh, again, something that we saw in the um, start of our study in, in chapter 1, is Paul's theology of suffering. And this was really, really important uh, for the Corinthians to understand this theology of, of, of suffering. They were struggling to see how it was that Paul, who claimed to be an apostle and a man who was chosen uh, by Christ to represent Christ, uh, they were struggling to understand how that could be so and Paul suffer as badly as he did. It didn't make sense to them that, that someone who followed God, who loved God, and, and would say that God loved them would suffer like Paul was suffering. 
It was as if his life of suffering in, in Corinth disqualified him as a true apostle. And so it had them questioning his message of the gospel. So it was really important for Paul to address this suffering and, and, and a, a solid theology of suffering. It was important for the Corinthians because of the gospel message. And hear me, it's important for us. It's really important for us that we understand as well this theology of suffering. Suffering is uh, just an, an inevitable part of life in this fallen world. Uh, it isn't a question of will we suffer. The real question is when will we suffer and how much will we suffer? And what will our suffering look like? And we will suffer. We will suffer sickness. We will suffer income loss. We will suffer job loss. We will suffer infertility. Uh, we will suffer pregnancy loss. We'll suffer the loss of people who are close to us, people that we love. We'll suffer the loss of, of friends. We'll suffer broken marriages. We will suffer and hurt. We will suffer for our faith. I believe this is increasingly so as our, as our culture shifts and changes. We will suffer for our faith if we cling to the, to the faith that, that, that we hold firmly and, and our faith in the Word of God and who God is and what He has done for us. As we hold to that, we will be sometimes attacked, sometimes laughed at, harassed, ostracized, not just by friends, but by family as well. We will suffer. It is a part of life in this broken world. And then the question becomes, if this is true, if we will suffer, and how will we respond? How will we respond to the suffering that comes our way? I don't mean by that, will we suffer with a smile on our face? That's not what I mean. I don't mean, will we suffer and, 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 and stay happy or at least act like we're happy so that the people around us think that we're happy and not suffering. I don't mean that at all. I mean, will our suffering lead us away from our faith? Will our suffering lead us to silence? Or will our suffering produce fruit and glory for us, for God, and for the people around us? How will we respond? Because here's the truth. When we suffer by faith, our suffering points others to Jesus, glorifying Him. Let me say that again. That's, a, that's the big idea this morning. I think that's where Paul would have us land and where I hope that we land this morning. When we suffer by faith, our suffering points others to Jesus glorifying Him. Let's pray this morning as we get started. Suffering is such a heavy, heavy subject. And so um, I ask especially that you pray with me this morning. Um, pray that the Holy Spirit would be really good to teach us this morning. And there are people around you this morning. If it's not you suffering, there are people around you who are suffering this morning. Pray for them as well. And pray that we would all be encouraged and grow um, more and more into the image of Jesus through these words from Paul. Pray that we would all be encouraged in our suffering this morning. Would you pray that with me? Yes? Let's pray together then. Father, we come together to you. Um, what a privilege it is for us to pray together. We, we come needy this morning. Oh, Father, we, we are always needy, but, but we come today humbly asking for your help. Uh, Father, as, as we suffer or people around us suffer, um, it, it is hard and we need to be encouraged. We need to be strengthened in our suffering. And Father, I believe my aim and our aim together, I believe, is, is truly for the good of others and for your glory as well. And so, Father, teach us this morning. Holy Spirit, be good. Be good to encourage us. Be good to teach us. Be good to help us um, see rightly how, how suffering fits into our lives and how it can be, how it can be used for, for your good and your glory. For the good of the people around us, help us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Okay, I want to give a little bit more um, context just to remind you guys of where we've been. Uh, these false teachers had come into the church in Corinth, and uh, the, the teachers who were coming, they were false apostles claiming to be uh, apostles of Jesus. And um, as they came into the church, they were, they were putting Paul down, putting his message down, and saying that the church in Corinth shouldn't listen or follow Paul. They were discrediting Paul and his message. Now, remember as we've talked about them that they came to the church um, sort of like superstar teachers, right? They came into the church as, as people who were highly respected by other churches, highly respected and, and revered in the community. They were, they were powerful speakers, and so they came in as, as, as great men uh, in the church, Um, They came with letters of recommendation. We talked about that, that they would come with letters of recommendation from other churches and other community leaders. Those letters of recommendation would tell the church what great and powerful people they were and and how incredible they were at speaking. And so they were recommending these men to those churches that they come uh, and teach. They They were touting them as great and powerful men of God. What we saw last week as we talked about those letters of recommendation and the Apostle Paul, Paul came into the church where they came with these letters of greatness presenting themselves as great. Paul responded to the church when they said, but you, Paul, have no letters of recommendation. He said, you're right, I don't have any letters of recommendation. I am nothing. Paul's response was, I I am not great. I I am nothing but a servant. I serve you, and I, and I serve Jesus by serving you. I am nothing. So when we come then to verses 7 through 12, Paul continues this line of thought, and, and what Paul says is that suffering reveals our weakness and his great power. Suffering reveals our weakness and his great power. Look at verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. So again, the false apostles coming in, uh, touting themselves as great and glorious. And Paul says that he and those who minister with him, they are not great or glorious. They are simple jars of clay. And, And what Paul is talking about there is just everyday common jars of clay. He, he wasn't talking about beautiful artisan vases or pitchers or anything like that. He, he, he was talking about plain, misshapen, maybe cracked, brown, everyday clay pots. Paul says, that's us. We're nothing. Just regular, common, everyday people. The treasure is not us. The treasure is in us. The treasure, Paul is saying, when he, when he says the treasure in us, what he's pointing back to is, is what he had just been talking about. He's pointing back to the gospel message that he's been talking about. The treasure that he's referring to is the light that God shone in the darkness of his heart. The treasure is the knowledge that Paul now has of, of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for him. The treasure is the new heart that Paul has been given by by the Spirit of God that that now awakens him to the beauty and the glory of Jesus. In other words, what Paul is saying when he refers to the treasure being in us, the treasure is the Spirit of God at work in and through Paul through this simple message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The treasure is, is, is God by His Spirit at work in Paul's life, but not just at work in Paul's life, at work in, in the believers of Corinth as well. It, it's this treasure that Paul is referring to now. It, it's the same treasure as when Paul said before, we don't need letters of recommendation. You are our letters of recommendation. You are our letters of recommendation because we see in you and you know in yourselves that that the treasure is in you, that the Spirit of God has come to you and given you a new heart and, and fresh eyes to see the beauty and the glory of Jesus. You are our recommendation because your lives are being transformed into the image of Jesus by the treasure that is in you. 
Paul says God has, has done this. God has done this in such a way not to demonstrate our greatness. We are not great at all. God has done it in, in this way so that he can demonstrate his own surpassing power and greatness. We aren't great and powerful. He is. We are simple, cracked, and broken jars of clay. So from there, Paul gives then an overview of, of, of their suffering, his ministry team, and particularly his own suffering. In verse 8, he says, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to, to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. So, so stop here for a minute, and, and let's think about what Paul is saying. I want to read just so we understand when Paul is saying this, that he is uh, persecuted and perplexed and afflicted. Um, I want to remind you of some verses that we read in chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians, beginning in verse 23. We're going to read those again just so that you can see what Paul is talking about. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I'm talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a day and a night I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers." in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, my list could go on and on, Paul says, apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Now that list of suffering will really make you feel inept when it comes to your own suffering, right? I mean, that was a lot that Paul has gone through. So when, when Paul, it's this list that Paul has in mind when Paul says that he is afflicted in every way. This is what he means, that Paul was truly afflicted in, in every way. When he says he is perplexed, this is a, a, a strange word that is hard to translate into English from the original language. I, I think that maybe what Paul is saying that everything is lost to him. Paul has lost everything. It's not that Paul is at a loss. Paul is at a loss of everything and a loss for everything. And when you look at his life, you can say Paul truly lost everything that he had worked for. He has been persecuted, Paul says, but not struck down. Beaten with rods, beaten with hands, stoned and left for dead. So, so when we talk about Paul and his life of suffering, this was his life of suffering. I, I, I love the story in Acts 14, I want to remind you of it, uh, of Paul being stoned by an angry mob. Now uh, imagine with me, like for real, use your imagination this morning and think about this story in Paul's life. Paul is preaching the gospel in a city. And the religious leaders, particularly the Jewish religious leaders, they are in disagreement with Paul and they're arguing and they're fighting with Paul and they're losing. And so they're angry with Paul. So the religious leaders incite a mob and the mob of people come against Paul and attack Paul and to the point where they literally attack him with stones. They stone the apostle Paul. Paul, it's, they throw these stones at Paul and his body is beaten and battered and bloody. He collapses on the ground. They continue to throw stones. That's what happened when you stone someone. You stone someone to death. And so they threw stones at Paul until they were certain that Paul was dead. And then they dragged his body out of the city, outside of the gates of the city. And, and, and there was Paul in a, in a bloody, beaten, battered heap. Paul was dead as far as anyone could tell. And everyone who looked on thought that Paul was dead. There outside the city gates, the disciples gather around him after all of his accusers have left him. There is dead. They gather around him, and I imagine that they are weeping and crying, standing around Paul, looking down at Paul. They've lost their friend. They've lost this teacher and this missionary and, and church planter, this man of God. They've lost him. They're weeping and they're crying, looking down at this bloody, beaten heap of a man, and all of a sudden his eyes open. Like just boom, 
Paul's eyes open and he gets to his feet. I mean, unbelievable. Unbelievable. He's dead and then his eyes pop open and Paul gets up to his feet. And I don't know about you, but I would have been getting on out of town. Not Paul. Paul, beaten, bloody, dead, his eyes open, he stands to his feet and he walks back into the city. Right through the gate that he was just dragged out of because his work wasn't finished. Isn't that an incredible story? How? <laughs> like, I, I love this story and I just think, how? Because really, I would not go back in the city. And, and I would have been trying to keep Paul from going back into the city as well, as well. Paul, how? How do you do that? How do you have that kind of, of strength and determination to keep doing what it is that you're doing in the midst of this terrible pain and this, this horrible suffering? They just, they just stoned you to death. Now, if, if that had happened to any of the false apostles, that would have been at the top of their letter of recommendation. I was once stoned and dragged from the city, and I got up and went back into the city to teach again. I am mighty and amazing. But not Paul. Not Paul at all. Paul would say it wasn't me. Paul would say that, that wasn't me. In fact, that's what he's saying in these verses. He's saying, I am weak. I am a broken, common clay pot. I am absolutely nothing. It, it wasn't me. It was, the, it was the surpassing power of God that opened my eyes and gave me strength in my legs. It's by His grace and by, by His power. By, by Him, the treasure within me. It is, it is by Him. The treasure within me that, that, that I am afflicted but never crushed. I, I am at a loss of all things but I never despair. By his great power I am persecuted but I am never forgotten and never forsaken. I am struck down again and again and again. Oh, but by his grace and power never destroyed. Then Paul adds in verse 10, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. And don't, don't, don't miss this. Paul is saying that, that our life in, in Christ, this life of suffering that is ours, is the very manifestation of the life of Christ, our Savior, in us and through us. Our lives given over daily to this suffering and this death are lived out this way with this suffering and with this death for the sake of Jesus. And for the good of others. While it is death in us, Paul is saying, it is, a, it is a beautiful thing that we manifest the life and the death of Jesus himself. This suffering is the picture of his suffering. Our death is the picture of his death. As, as he lived and as he suffered and as he died for others, we live this out daily in our own suffering for you. Now I want you to hear me on this. Paul is not saying that suffering itself is what honors and glorifies Jesus. Don't miss this. Don't miss this part. Paul isn't saying that, that it's suffering alone that is for the good of others. It, it's not just suffering. Suffering is just suffering, and everyone suffers in this broken world, whether they are followers of Christ or not followers of Christ. So it isn't the suffering itself that points people to the life of Christ. Paul can say that our lives, his life, their life, our lives of suffering and death point to the suffering and death of Christ because by faith, Paul's words always pointed to Christ. His faith in who Jesus was 
and what Jesus had done. His faith in the brilliant light that had revealed the darkness deep in his own heart. His faith that it was, it was the work of God through the gospel that, that transformed him. His faith in the promises of God who is faithful, always faithful. That faith led him to see suffering as something more than suffering. It, it was an opportunity. It was an opportunity to proclaim Jesus. We speak from faith in suffering. We speak from faith in suffering. Now, I I, I didn't say this first service. Let, Let me say it here. No matter what, we speak from faith in suffering. And sometimes our suffering points to Jesus. We're going to talk about how Paul's did, but oftentimes our suffering only points to us and our hopelessness. But always, in our suffering, we speak of what our true faith is. So stick with me. We speak from faith in suffering. That This is the key to our suffering, and whether it is for God's glory and the good of others or not. Um, verse 13. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke... We also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Paul says, I was, I was afflicted but never crushed. I, I am at a loss in all things, but I never despair. I am persecuted, but I am never forgotten and forsaken. I am struck down again and again and again, but I am never destroyed because I know. Because I know, I know, I know, I know this is not the end. I know that one day our great God, our, our great Father, who by His Spirit raised Jesus from death, will also raise me from death. Paul believed that. Paul believed this was not the end. Whatever he suffered, however much he suffered, there was, there was more to it than this. And, and, and his great God, as he had raised Jesus from the dead, would raise him as well. And not just him right? Paul says us, that he will raise us, and not just us like Paul and the people who who ministered with Paul, but Paul was talking to the Corinthians. He will raise us. He will raise you, Corinthians. One day as followers of Christ, he will raise us up, and we will see Jesus face to face. Me, Paul says, and and the people who minister with me, and, and we will stand with you, Corinthians, but not just us and not just you. There's more. There's more as the gospel goes out more and more from us. And the gospel goes out more and more from you. There are more and more people who will hear the gospel and believe the gospel. More and more there will be people around us who will be praising with us the glory of our great God and Savior. They will join you. They will join us. They will join me and my goodness at the Thanksgiving. Church, that's what Paul believed. Can can you imagine? Can you imagine the, 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 the beauty of looking around one day as we are, as we are gathered with Jesus and the, and the ten people that, that we spoke to uh, about Jesus who, 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 who believed the gospel and that, that ten people that Paul started with is, is multiplied to become twenty people and the twenty people to become eighty people and the eighty people multiplied to, to, to eight hundred people as the gospel continues to go further and further out and eight hundred people become eight 8,000 people, and 8,000 people become 8 million people. Can you imagine the voices of all the, all the tribes and the tongues together praising our great God and Savior? We believe that, Paul said. So we speak. We 
We believe that. We believe that the gospel goes out in the midst of our suffering. We believe that, that, that we have something beautiful to proclaim. We believe that, and so we cannot and will not stop proclaiming him. We believe that, and so we cannot be crushed. We cannot be crushed by the weight of, of this affliction because, because we believe that. We believe, and so we will not despair. We believe, and we know that we will never be alone. We, we believe, and because we believe, there is no way we, we will ever be crushed. We are afflicted, but we are never destroyed. We believe in his power. We believe in his promises. We believe and therefore we speak. As long as we believe, we will speak. Put this together. It, it isn't suffering alone that points the world to Jesus. It is suffering by faith. Truly believing. This wasn't a story to Paul. This wasn't knowledge in his head where, where, where he could talk about it, maybe. We believe, therefore we speak. Then Paul says, we do not lose heart when we remember the gospel, verse 16. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light momentary affliction. Think about that, this light momentary affliction. Think about the list that we just read of all that Paul suffered. I would not call that light momentary affliction. Momentary, yes. Light, no way. But, but what we should get from that is not how amazing that Paul is but how glorious the glory is that Paul is about to mention. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, they're passing away, but the things that are unseen are eternal. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul tells us the gospel, what the good news of the gospel is. And Paul boils it down to this, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Sin separated us from God. Sin separates us from God. And, and there is no way that we on our own can overcome it, right? We, we, we have sinned, and there's no way for us to make that sin go away. We, we can try as hard as we want to, to, to live without sin, and we will fail because we are, we are weak and broken vessels of clay. Because of our brokenness, we, we, we will sin. We will sin again, and we will sin again. There's nothing that we can do to overcome the sin that we have in our life. And, and, and that's the bad news. The good news is we don't need to because God sent his son, Jesus, to do that for us. To, to do what we could never do on our own. He, he sent Jesus. Jesus came to live the life that we can't live perfect and holy and righteous and pure. He lived a life without sin. Though he was sinless, Jesus went to the cross and died there, taking upon himself our sins. He suffered the wrath of God and the death that we deserve because of sin, though he knew no sin. Beautifully, on the third day, the power of God and the Spirit raised Jesus from death, defeating death and sin and Satan and all of that so that when we believe, when we trust in His work, His life, His death and resurrection, by faith, when we trust in that, then we are granted forgiveness of our sins. They are cast as far as the east is from the west, never to be so seen and never to be known by God again. And more beautifully than that, we're not just neutral creatures. The very righteousness of Jesus himself, his perfection is granted to us as if it is our own perfection. And the beautiful news of the gospel is when we trust in the work of Jesus and all that he's done, then even though we are sinners today as followers of Christ, trusting in him, when God looks at us, what he sees is a beautiful son or daughter, perfect and pure and holy and righteous. 
just like Jesus. But there is more. There is more to this good news. One day our Savior, who is now in heaven at the right hand of the Father, one day our Savior is coming back. He is coming back, Jesus is, to fix all that is broken. When he comes back, he will will judge the Father's enemies and he will usher in the kingdom that was intended before sin entered the world. He, He will usher in his kingdom and we will see him face to face and we will fully and finally be redeemed and we will be restored to all that he intended us to be as humans, as his as his children. In that day and forevermore, there will be no more sin. And there will be no more suffering. And we will be united with with all those in Christ who have gone before us. And and we will join with all those who will come after us. No more sin, no more suffering, no more hurt, no more sickness, no more worry, no more strife. And He will wipe away every tear. Paul believed that. It it wasn't abstract theology for Paul. It was his confident expectation. It wasn't a Sunday school or, or, or a theology class question for Paul. It was buried deep in his heart. He believed it. Paul was confident that, 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 that what he was experiencing in that moment, in all of that suffering, was very short-lived in light of eternity. He believed that Jesus was, was one day truly coming to fix all that sin had broken. It was so certain for Paul that he could say, we don't lose heart. We don't lose heart in this, this present and passing suffering and loss. There's so much more that lies ahead. So let me try to pull all of this together. Paul, the Corinthians, were were thinking and they were asking, if you were truly an apostle, if you were a man of God, why do you suffer so much? Why is there so much suffering in your life? Paul's answer. I suffer so that you and everyone else can see that I am nothing and God is everything. I suffer so that that, that all can see the surpassing power, not of me, but the surpassing power and greatness of God. I am weak. I am common. The power that is demonstrated through, through my suffering is His great power. Our suffering, Paul would say, gives us opportunity to point to Him. Because of Him, because of His power within us, we we can suffer terribly and not be shaken. We can be afflicted in every way, every way that we read a few minutes ago. We can be afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not, not forgotten or forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Our testimony, Paul is saying, is a testimony to his greatness. For us, we bear in our suffering the suffering and death of Jesus. It glorifies him, and it is for the good of others. Paul, Paul, how do you suffer so much and still point others to Jesus? Family, this is the key to a theology of suffering. Everyone suffers and everyone will suffer. Paul, how do you suffer and, 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 and not get so down that you walk away from your faith? Paul, how do you suffer so much, so much hurt and so much pain and so much loss? How do you do that and, and, and still point others to Jesus? Paul's answer I can suffer terribly and continue. I can suffer terribly and continue to point others to Jesus because I believe. I want to say this again. Paul is not saying because I know. Because I have knowledge of the right answer or the right thing to say. Paul is saying, I believe. 
Because I believe this to be true. I believe this deep in my heart. I believe in the midst of my suffering. I believe and therefore I speak. What we believe about God, about who He is and about what He has done, as, as well as all that He has promised to do, what we, what we truly believe shapes our suffering. Paul never said it was easy. Paul's suffering was painful. Suffering is painful. Paul's was painful. It was, it was, he really was afflicted. He was, he was truly afflicted in, in every way. He, he really lost everything. Everything that he had worked for, his family, his friends, his income, everything that he had given his life to when he came to Christ, he lost everything. He, he was truly persecuted and chased and struck down and run out of city after city after city. He was struck down, beaten repeatedly. He even expressed that there were, there were so many times in his, in his ministry that he was, he was anxious and, and worried, burdened for the people who were his close friends in ministry, burdened for the churches that he loved so much. I am sure in all of that that, that, that Paul had times of doubt and uncertainty, but again and again and again he was brought back to what it was that he truly believed. And what he truly believed, again, not his Sunday school answers, but what he truly believed shaped his life. And that's what shapes our lives. It was because of his belief that he could continue to stand. It was because of his belief that he could say, I'm just common clay. I am nothing. If, if we think that we are something, then our immediate question is, why me? Why am I suffering? All the things that I've done for you, Lord, I've been trying so hard. Man, Paul could have said that. I am nothing. Common clay. Man, my God is amazing. It was because of his true belief that he could hold on to the promises of forevermore with his father. It, it was because of his true belief that in the midst of all of that terrible suffering, he spoke the beautiful gospel of Jesus Christ. Because he truly believed, truly believed, that the, power, that the gospel was the power of God unto salvation. He truly believed that the power of God unto salvation was found in that simple message. And so he proclaimed that simple message to himself, and he proclaimed that simple message to, to others around him. He believed, therefore he spoke, because he, he believed that the, 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 the power, it was the power of God in him and, and through this gospel message that would rescue and redeem others. He, he, he rejoiced. He could rejoice even in his suffering because his suffering brought a great opportunity to say, I am nothing and God is everything. Let me tell you about my Jesus who suffered. He knew one day Right In the midst of his suffering, in the midst of his suffering, he knew that a, a, another day was coming. And the day was coming when, when he would stand befo before the Lord and see him face to face. And not only him, but everyone else who had come with him. What I'm saying is he, he saw his suffering as an opportunity to proclaim the gospel because he believed one day as he proclaimed the gospel in the midst of his suffering, people would come to believe and trust in Jesus. And they would be a part of the, the 80, the 800, the 8,000, the 8 million who would sing with him the glory of his great God and Savior. He believed it. That's what it means to suffer by faith. And that's what I meant earlier when, when we started and I, I said when we suffer by faith, our suffering points others to Jesus glorifying him. There is meaning and purpose to your suffering. And I want to say two things on that. I'll say them quickly. One is there are people around you suffering. 
And at New City, we talk about being a family. We, we need to know that there are people around us who are suffering, and, and we need to walk with them in their suffering. We need to love them in their suffering. We need to be patient with them in their suffering. And sometimes that means just listening to people in their suffering and telling them, I'm sorry and I love you. And then other times in their suffering, there will be opportunities for us to remind them of the beauty and the glory of Jesus and and, and the hope that is ours forevermore because of what he has done for us. We declare that he is great even in the midst of our suffering so 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 new city is family walk with the people around you don't be afraid of their suffering wade into their suffering with them even when you don't have an answer and love them we believe therefore we speak the other is this i said i wasn't going to do this but i am I grew up Baptist, and I have always pastored or been on staff in Baptist churches, right? So, I, you know, it's okay for you to make fun of yourself, so I'm going to make fun of myself. I, I have been to so many Baptist meetings and, and, and Baptist, big Baptist meetings. I've been with pastors from all over the country, and, and, and I really don't say this to make fun of I say it in sadness we walk into that room and everybody has a smile on their face I can't even smile as big you know big smile on their face brother how are you today huh I am good I am blessed life is incredible life is great when you come here and people ask you here how are you today oh I'm doing great everything's good in my world don't lie Don't waste your suffering. Some days you're not okay, and that's okay. Someday someday we need to hear that life for you just stinks right now. When you you hide that and you put on the fake smile and you tell everybody that you're just hashtag blessed, what you're doing is encouraging them to fake it. Or you're sending them away from the truth of the gospel. Something must be wrong with me because everybody else is always happy and my life just stinks. Don't waste your suffering. Don't waste your suffering. Use your suffering for for the glory of God. Let Him use your suffering for His glory and for the good of others. Say again, when we suffer by faith, our suffering points others to Jesus, glorifying him. Let's pray. Father, you have made us family so that we can walk through our suffering together. You have given us your spirit to encourage us and to empower us, to remind us even of the good news of the gospel. You use us as family to do that as well. So my prayer this morning, we will all suffer. Some are suffering now. I pray, Father, that your spirit would encourage them in their suffering, that they would remember the beautiful promises that you have made. And one of those is that, that even though they feel alone, you have promised you will never forsake them, never leave them. Remind them, Holy Spirit, this morning that you are with them. And that Jesus himself has suffered far, far more than we. I pray as well, Father, that our suffering wouldn't be wasted when it comes to one another, that we would depend not only on you and the spirit, but on the family that you've given us. That we would encourage one another, that we would walk with one another, that we would love one another. And in that, point one another to Jesus. Help us. Help us. In Jesus' name, amen. As we close out this morning, um, we'll close out as we do every week at New City with communion. If you didn't grab one of the communion packets when you came in, they're at the um, 
entry coming into the sanctuary downstairs and at the top of the stairs upstairs. Feel free to grab one of those. And as we sing, take a minute. If the Holy Spirit has convicted you of something in your own life, maybe not viewing suffering rightly, maybe not walking through your suffering as you should, maybe not being available to the suffering of others. I don't know. If the Holy Spirit has convicted you this morning of anything like that, repent. That means turn from that and turn to Him. Come to Him where, where He is ready to forgive and to love you. And to say, let's go again, right? Like every day is a new day and a new start. That's the beauty of grace. So repent, turn to Him, and take communion. The the reminder of us, of his suffering, his life, and his death on our behalf. The, the bread representing his body given for us. The juice represents his blood shed for us. In that we have redemption. Forgiveness of our sin, we are made children of God. Repent. Believe the good news today. And, and take communion and joy in Christ. Would you stand?
against the wall and it looked as if it was over you you made a way and we're standing here only because you made a way as our gathering comes to a close the holy spirit is encouraging and reminding us of what a beautiful redeemer we have in Jesus Christ. So let's sing of him the way, the truth, and the life. There is a name I love to call. I send my prison spirit free. I can't explain, but all I know is by his power now i can see oh hallelujah go through any of your suffering alone. The Spirit is dwelling in you, and He's constantly reminding you of this glorious news of Jesus that we've celebrated here today. Now go as a family of missionary servants that are called to share this good news and this hope of Christ with those around us. New City Church, you are sent.
to that stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs at the end